the, the great thing about that is, is I know that if I've done it through two of like, probably like the hardest life transitions that you can have, like I know I'm, yeah, it's going to be easy moving forward. It'll just get easier for me. Yeah. So tell me, how is your December starting? It's going pretty, it's going pretty well. I mean, this has been a slower month for me. I think my revenue was maybe at like 28. Um, but I definitely have had a harder month. December is a little bit harder than most of the other months, I think. Yeah. And we're like 18 days in and do you have any shoot schedule for the rest of the year? No, I'm done. So my last shoot was on Monday and I'm done now for the rest of the year. I have, um, I've had four ordering appointments this week. I have one more tomorrow and then that's my last until January 9th. And by the way, today's topic is actually, um, we were talking about this before, but basically we always talk about, you know, where you are now. I think you just went live in the group, in the Facebook group and you yeah. said, you know, you hit 500 K again. Yeah. Second year in a row. And while that's so impressive for most people, they're just like, heck, I just need to get to a hundred K. Right. Yeah. 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 So we're basically going to talk through like if everything was like taken away and you had no Facebook group, no email list, no nothing, like what would your order of operations be to like get your portfolio back? Like imagine like a fire or something just took everything yeah. away or you moved away for four years and you had to come back. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a loaded question. That's a lot of work. I mean, so it's all, you always have to start with the work, right? Like you always have to have a foundation of work. If, if the work isn't solid, it's really hard to build a business without that. So, you know, if I was picking up and moving to a new place, I at least would have a portfolio, right? But like, where it starts to get tricky is for the people that don't have a portfolio yet, right? Like how they, where would they find the people to start building their portfolio? Cause that's the first step. Yeah. So, and, and, and by the way, like, um, in this scenario, we're going to say that you have $5,000, you have no portfolio. You don't even have a camera. So you don't even have a, oh. camera. this would be your chance to switch over to Sony as I've been pleading. Boy, you're making me think today. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of thinking. Um, so before we even get into that, I know, you know, we can't just skip over the fact that like two years in a row you did it. Um, and you just had a baby this year. Uh, yeah, well actually, so he's going to be one on the 22nd. So, um, I had a baby, uh, December 22nd of 2018. So in what's today, the 18th and four days, he's going to be one. Holy smokes. In four days, he's going to be one. Yeah. I know it's crazy. Um, when we first, when we met a year ago, he was only like a month old. Yeah. I remember when I flew up to Delaware, I just thought like, this is like a real little baby. Like, how are you even doing this? I have, I have one seven year old who can like feed herself, go to the bathroom and like, I don't have to change diapers. I was like, how do you run a business with a baby? Yeah. And two others, two other little ones. I mean, luckily I have a really supportive spouse, but um, really supportive partner and he's amazing. Um, but really like being very structured, like I'm very organized. I have systems, like we have schedules, you know, and that really helps, but it was definitely very challenging with a newborn, you know, cause I, the first year I hit 500, I was pregnant for most of the year. And then the second year I hit 500 this year, I had, um, a newborn and then an infant, you know? Um, so the, the great thing about that is, is I know that if I've done it through two of like, probably like the hardest life transitions that you can have, like I know I'm, yeah, it's going to be easy moving forward. It'll just get easier for me. Yeah. What's it going to be like when you're not like hindered with family or like physically? Oh, right? I'm going to. I mean, it was, I'll tell you what, it was great this year shooting and not being pregnant. I was like, boy, this is really nice. <laughs> yeah. It's tiring even when you're not pregnant. So I can't even imagine like yeah. having that, like. I was a disaster. I actually, so I shot full time. I shot until I was 38 weeks and I get super sick when I'm pregnant and I had to um, get IV iron. So I would go and get IV iron and then I would come back and shoot a session. 
Oh my God, I have like the wrapper on my arm and um, cause I, I pass out, I get really sick. So um, yeah, so shooting this year, not being pregnant, I was like, boy, this is great. I'm gonna move these couches around all I want. It's awesome. Yeah, and by the way, um, we did have a comment once before about us talking and I, I always, I know that there's always like detractors and I don't, I, I think it says more about the person thinking this and it's like, you know, we see people that have success and then we instantly have to put like barriers up. So it's like, well, we mm -hmm. don't know if she was super rich, if her father was a photographer, if, you know, her husband gave her everything and, yeah. she, you know, she just got really lucky. So let's even go back, like before you even got to that, right? There was a lot of years of work that most people yeah. don't see, right? Like people Absolutely. just see the, the end product now. Like, yeah. how did you even get started? You know, yeah. is this something? So... My father was a photographer, but he was also a teacher. Um, and the photography was more like his side hustle. It wasn't his, you know, full-time business. Um, so I grew up with like a dark room in our basement, but digital is very different than film. So, you know, that skill set, of course, isn't, I mean, it's nice to have, but it doesn't really help me run my business now. Um, but I was a speech pathologist. I went to school for, you know, seven years, four years in undergrad, a year of prereqs for the master's program, and then two years. Um, and my husband is a doctor of physical therapy, which those sound like really good jobs, right? But they're not when you have 300,000 in school loans. <laughs> like, this isn't like, you know, you don't get out and make a lot of money when you have $300,000 in school loans to pay off. So yeah, I mean, they were great jobs if you don't have school loans, but we were barely scraping by like, because his school loan payment alone is $2,500 a month. It was more than our mortgage. So we, about nine years ago, um, for Black Friday, my husband, really, because he was working really, really long days as a physical therapist, like eight in the morning to 10 at night. And I was just bored. I, w I didn't know anyone here in Delaware. I didn't you know, have any, like a friend circle. So he just got me a camera. It's like, I think keep me like pacified. He's like, great, I'll get her like a hobby. Like this will be a hobby for her. A nice little thing to like keep her busy, right? Um, and then it just turned into like this amazing life-changing thing. Um, but of course it took years. I mean, I've been shooting since, oh, I don't know, 2011 maybe, 2012. So but like, how, how long did it take you to like actually take it super seriously where like wow. you treated it the same as when you were like going to become a speed pathologist, right? Like yeah. I'm sure like the, you know, when you're becoming a speed pathologist, I can't even say I that. love that you're having trouble saying a speed pathologist. Maybe I need one. Yeah. But like, obviously like, you know, you knew it was going to be rigorous. You knew it was going to be four years yeah. of undergrad, like the whole seven years. Like, when did you get serious about photography when you were like, okay, I am on a track and I know I'm trying to get somewhere. And when did you yeah. start taking it seriously? So I was in a unique position because I was working a marketing job. So I had a lot of um, flexibility and I was able to shoot full time while I was working that marketing job. And I started realizing that I could make a lot of money. And so back in 20, 20, 17, my gross was 280 for photography and my day job was like 95. And so when we got to that point, um, through 2017, I looked at my husband, I was like, I made twice as much doing photography as I did my day job. So, and I'm booked for 2018. So let's just do it. And it was at that point, I would say like mid 2016, um, into 2017 that I realized I could, I could really make a living off of this. And then, I mean, it's just gotten better from there. Cause once you figure out the systems and you like figure out what you need to do to make it work, everything just starts coming. Like it just, the, the, the wheels keep turning. You, you have to do less cranking and they're more just like turning by themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It takes less willpower. Uh, it's funny. I was actually talking to, I, I was, I think it was on our mastermind call on Mondays that I do. Um, we were talking about it and it was like a lot of times people get started on this path or they find this group or they find you and they'll say something like, okay, I need to get to where Jen is. Yeah. But like you're the finished product right now. So yeah. if someone like doesn't have a portfolio and they, 
you know, and they're starting out and they don't have, you know, the sales training or just like the confidence and they're looking at you right now, they're, they're basically going to say, and almost correctly. So it's almost like, what else would you um, think? They think, okay, I need to emulate what she does right now. And they don't realize like they should be emulating Jen from like 2017, 2016, like the one grinding and hustling Yeah. or, you know, someone like Liz Hansen, by the way, I was talking to Liz Hansen uh, from Chicago Boudoir. I think she got, this is her first year in business. She got, she said one of her biggest months this month or this year was about 28,000. And I I just thought about that. I was like, they need to be looking and emulating like previous you or the people that are up and coming right now, right? Like what have you done for me lately? The people now. So I guess that's kind of what prompted this conversation is if you lost everything or if you were going to be a student in the mastermind and you were like about to get started, like even with your experience, like where would you even start if you didn't have 10, you know, 10,000 plus women in a Facebook group or email list? to reach out to you? I was interviewing Heather Nixon yesterday and she just started shooting boudoir in January and now she's having $20,000 months, right? Same thing since joining our mastermind. And I just looked at her and I was like, oh my God, I wish I would have had the mastermind whenever I was just starting because it wouldn't have taken me four years. It would have only taken me a year, right? Because all of this information that we've like spent, that I've spent years and years creating, that you've spent years and years like learning and creating are all at our students' fingertips instead of having to like piecemeal and put things together and and trial things and figure things out. So, um, so where would you start? So day one, first of all, let's, let's get like the fun questions. Yes. So you have $5,000, you have to spend it before December 31st to get all the ball. Balls. You know, I'm really good at spending money. Oh, so <laughs> no, no, 5,000. That's not that much. So you got to buy a camera. What camera lens, what camera are you buying first? Well, um, I would, so I shoot with a 750. I probably would just stay with that because that I'm not, such a cheap, by the way, for anyone out listening, like that is like an eight, nine year old camera. And I can't believe you shoot with that. I do. I do, but it's good enough. So yeah, yeah. I, it produces excellent work. It's sharp. I like the way it works. Okay. I, and, by, and by the way, I think used, maybe it might cost 800, 900, yeah. maybe. I mean, it's not an expensive camera. No, it's okay. not an expensive body at all. So you have a camera, D750. Yeah. Then what about lens? What are you ordering? I use a 24 to 70. I have a bunch of lenses in my office. I don't use any of them. They just sit there and collect dust. They're literally like paperweights. <laughs> okay. So let's just say, what does that take us up to? Like maybe 2,500? Oh gosh, isn't that like, I don't, I don't even know because I've had that lens for like four years. I don't know how much it is now. Okay. So we'll go use eBay or KEH or something. We're at 2,500. Yeah. Next, let's just say studio. In-home studio or are you going to go rent a place, Airbnb? No, I would in your home because if you don't have any money coming in, you don't want to put money out. So all you need is like some good windows, which most houses have windows, right? Um, whether you shoot bright and airy or whether you shoot dark and moody, you just use the ambient light. Um, and like you could use your living room and get a couch. Like this couch behind me that I used to shoot on, um, a neighbor gave it to me. So it was free. That's so funny. The funny, the funniest thing is uh, one of my favorite photographers came down to Miami for Art Basel like a week or two ago. Yeah. And she's like a super ice photographer. She's a portrait master and she has this like huge five foot like parabolic. Uh-huh. What the heck, right? I'm out of the year game. So she's this, this huge soft box and we set it up and everything. It works perfectly the first day, works perfectly the second day. And on the third day, the bulb went out. And she like, we still needed it for a few hours. And she's like, oh man, like, oh, what am I going to do? So I like, literally, we took a speed light and we just pointed it up to the roof. You could not tell the difference between the lighting. I'm not even kidding. No. So the difference between a five foot and then her, because and we almost made it like a, you know, we put like a little bit of a cone on it to make it a little bit smaller, to make it like diffuse. Yeah. And no kidding, like it worked perfectly well. I bounced so. my speed light off the ceiling every and, session. Yeah. And, I, and that's so funny because I know when I went to go see you, I was like, no, this can't be that simple, right? Like it cannot be that simple because I remember when I was getting started or when a lot of people were getting started, like it's all about gear and we focus on that. And yeah. like, 
nine months go by and we barely made any decisions. We have a bunch of things in our cart. Yeah. But your suggestion is D750, 24 to 70 and... Mm, speed light. Like it doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a cheap one. one of, it was funny. One of my friends was like... Um, I, I forget. I think they saw just a picture of me shooting or something. And they were like, why don't you even have like, you're, you're just using a speed. Like, what are you doing? You're pointing it towards the ceiling. He was like, well, that's ridiculous. I was like, it works. And what's funny is my dad actually taught me that. Like, um, he was here visiting like five or six years ago. And he's like, your walls are all white use a speed light and point it at, you know, a wall or a ceiling. It's perfect. Um, and actually like even a step further, like he, when I was first starting, I would just take like a piece of tissue and put it over the, um, the light and diffuse it like that. By the way, for anyone listening, you're not going to be able to see the images, but this is Jen's portfolio. So you're saying almost all of this is, all of this has flash? All of it, yeah. It's all a speed light pointing towards the ceiling and ambient light. Yeah. And it's so crazy because this looks like super, super soft. Like I would not have been able to guess. Um, again, I don't I also don't like sit there and like stare at catch lights all day, but like you really can't tell even when you basically tell people. I know. It's always so funny. I actually unless someone like unless you talk to someone about their methods, like I just thought that everybody did things like this, you know, and it wasn't until I started really educating and teaching that when I would tell people this, they'd be like, what? I'd be like, well, I mean, it's what I've always done. I don't know. I didn't know that there was any other better way to do it because I didn't go to school for this. I didn't, you know, I just kind of figured it out on my own. And of course, like I said, my dad, like he was the one um, that really gave me the idea of course about using speed light. And then, like I said, when I first started, like I would diffuse with like, a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will say that, you know, I know not every single person can like shoot in the house. Maybe their house isn't as big yeah. or mm-hmm. I, I remember even me, like I used to, I, I thought I had a pretty house and I live in a great place in North Carolina, but like I was just a little bit self-conscious about bringing people there because yeah. it wasn't like a designer home interior. It was like a bro house. Yeah. Like, it was still clean, but everything was like black and like, sleazy. Right. And I'm like I can't. Um, so have you ever like, have you ever had a shoot in other clients' homes? Have you ever like gotten an Airbnb or like, have you ever yeah. had to do that? Yeah, all the time. Well now, of course, but I don't ever shoot in a client's home. Um, just because I don't like, I don't know what I'm walking into. And I just feel like for safety reasons also, like you just don't know like what you're going to. And also you don't know what the house is going to look like. So I always will get like, I'll get an Airbnb or I'll get a hotel room that I really like that I feel inspired by. Um, like I'm going, I shot in Vegas two years ago, um, in 20, no, no, 2018, I shot in Vegas and I just, I get like Airbnbs that I really like. And when I go back to Vegas for WPPI in February, I'm just, I think I might just get the same suite and then book shoots there because I've already booked that suite. So I have a portfolio from that, that environment. So it should be easier to book shoots. Yeah. Okay. So we have our gear and you, let's just say you, you like all your images are gone. I don't know. You, you burned them all and you have to yeah. start over. So what are you doing? Like you have a couple weekends and then you got to start paying bills. Like what are you going to yeah. do? Well, the first thing I would probably do is get, um, do like a legit model call, like not like a model call where you're trying to make money because I, I feel like that's a, a not a good way to start off. So, um, I would actually do a call for women that are as diverse as possible. This is another mistake I see a lot of photographers make is that their portfolio will be all models, like legit models. And it's really hard for real women to hire you if all they see is people that are like actually models. Like you need to have diversity in your portfolio. A woman won't hire you unless she knows that you can shoot women that look like her. So, you know, I would do a call for a 20 something, um, a 30 something, a 40 something, a 50 something, um, a 60 something, uh, women of all ethnicities, um, you know, but to start, like you want to have as much diversity as possible, especially like women, you know, that are curvy, slender women, you want to have as many different things to show as you can. 
which by the way, I can't forget. So I almost jumped one. Um, so you'd get that model call, but when you bring them into your home studio, or by, by the way, when I say home studio, people need to realize like, it's literally just a room in your house. Yeah. That's what, my front door. <laughs> what props would you have? Like, what are like must haves that you would buy things from Amazon? Is there backdrops? Is there yeah. paper? Is there anything you would buy? Yeah. So I use, um, um, a tapestry from Amazon as one of my like backdrops and it was maybe like $19 and I have two of them. So there's that. And then I also went to home goods and I have maybe like five or six furs that I'll put on the ground or I'll layer on that couch. Um, and you can change sets with just by changing the fur that people are laying on. Um, you know, you want to change the, the fur or the cloth and then their outfit. Um, and then that can like be a set change. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be like a super crazy set. And as I've been going, you know, I've been doing this more, like I've added things like I have those the plants behind me and like things like that. And those are from Amazon too. They were like 80 or $90. You don't have to spend a lot of money. The most expensive thing in my studio is my makeup stand that's in front of me that I, you know, I have my computer on right now. Yeah. I, I'm actually about to share. So let me actually see again, if you're listening up, I'll, I'll put some screenshots up in the notes of this, but yeah, that's the tapestry you have from, what is that from Amazon? Yeah. Amazon. And I just have a thumbtack to the wall. You can actually see the thumbtacks. By the way, another one is, is like how important starting out, because I know like in this video we covered kind of like your client closet and a little bit of what she brought. Like how much would you get to start? Cause I know a lot of people think like you have to have an entire closet or you can't do a shoot or like do you build, would you build it like slowly as you go? Yeah, I would definitely build it. I'm still building my client closet. I've, I've noticed that my curvier clients um, sometimes need a little bit more than um, my other clients. So I actually just got like three pairs of like Spanx underwear, like one X, two X, three X. And a few like um, plus size bodysuits to add to my closet. So I think you're like always adding things um, to like what you have. I think that that's important because as you go, like you'll notice that, you know, you might need more. And the big thing is like I found sometimes clients won't, um, sometimes clients won't bring underwear that fit. They'll just bring like the little G strings that come with bustiers and things like that. And that's, um, those don't photograph well, like they don't look good on anyone. So that's why I keep like those Spanx underwear, like more coverage. That way we can just put them under things. And of course they just wear like their regular underwear underneath of it. And then I just wash it and Clorox it whenever they're done. Yeah. It is so crazy with just, just a little bit of wardrobe and like just some textures, everything from the hardwood to the backdrops, like how many different looks you can get with just four walls and yeah. some texture in there. And, and by the way, like I feel like so many people get so, so stuck here and you spend, they spend tens of thousands of dollars. They don't yeah. use half of it. And then they end up kind of like you, like just putting everything in a closet and going back to like three things that they know works in every set. Yeah, I'm very simple. And I think the other thing is like, you always have to be evolving and changing. And just since we shot that, we shot that in like February, I guess. Um, my, my whole process has changed pretty significantly, even from then. Um, yeah, like I've, I've changed around a lot of my sets. I've changed around a lot of my posing. Um, so you have to like keep evolving as you continue to shoot. Like I still use that gray backdrop, but you know, where it used to be my topless set was in the middle. I've now moved that to the last set. I do it upstairs in the bedroom. I use white sheets more. So my style and like my posing flow is always evolving. I just did um, uh, another live shoot, maybe like to record for um, the course maybe like four months ago and my posing has completely changed since then. So it's important to like continue to grow and change your posing flow as well. Okay. So you've got all your equipment, you've got your studio, you've got like your 10 models in, maybe you made some sales from them. Maybe not. <laughs> what is next? Like, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to get in like three to four women every single month? 
Yeah. So in the very beginning, I was doing bridal shows. That was huge for me. Um, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You are surrounded by um, your ideal client, like women, right? Um, and I was doing eight to 10 a year. And it was definitely an investment um, to do the shows, but I would book about 1% of attendees. So if you book like a 3000 person show, like it was feasible for me to book 20 to 30 from that show. Um, and of course, now that I have an existing client base, um, I can easily book, you know, 30 to 40 from just putting up a flash sale. Um, and how, how, like, so how much would you expect? Like, that was my I, first show. Yeah. So Again, I, I have a picture of her uh, first show up. Two people. Uh, I had two shoots before I did that show. You can see them on the, there's oh, wow. one girl in two pictures and another girl in the other two pictures. Yeah, because even me, like, I, by the way, every, if you guys know me, I'm like very digitally orient, oriented. So like for me, this is like scary. Like if to me, it feels like it's such a huge investment or like, yeah, it's scary to me thinking maybe you have to have like 50 shoots done and like all this work. And you're literally telling me here you had only two models shot before. And you can even see the sample album that's on the table. It's the same girl. Like I literally had two shoots under my belt when I did this bridal show. You can see that it's like the same girl. And what has changed now since then? So like now it seems like you've gotten a little bit better. You've got walls, lights, and um, I've definitely leveled up since then. This is um, a bridal show I did in January. That was literally a week and a half after I had my baby. I was a disaster. You can see the chair in the corner. I don't usually. I would never sit at bridal shows, but I was sitting at that show. I was a mess. But I'd already reserved it. Like I'd already paid the the fee, and this is the biggest show of the year. So luckily, Nikki was there, my studio manager. That's my husband. Um, so they did the show with me, and I mostly sat for this one because I had just had a baby like a week and a half before that. Um, but how yeah, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, how do you even – and by the way, for if those that can't see it, like you have like a bridal contract, a script, like you have a giveaway for it. Like this entire thing is almost like its own little marketing funnel. Absolutely. What, yeah. what made you even want to like – do this from, let's just say from zero, you know, from just a few models, like what even prompted you to try this? So the funny thing is whenever, so I've always been like a marketer. I've always had that like brain of like, you know, thinking, how can I make this better? What can I do? So when I was, you know, talking to my husband and trying to figure out like how we could find clients, I was like, where would people go that wanted to hire a boudoir photographer? Um, we were like, bridal shows, right? Like there's, um, women everywhere. It's my, it's full of my ideal client. Um, so we picked this random show in Chester PA, which I know most of you probably don't know, but Chester is about 20 minutes from Philly. It is not a good area. It's quite, um, dangerous in some places. <laughs> and we, it was at this casino and we were like, well, let's give it a shot. Let's do it. Um, and it was scary. Like it was like a $700 like fee to get in the show. And I was, I am not gonna lie. I did not know we put it on a credit card. I was scared. And if you look up like how to do a bridal show as a boudoir photographer, there is very little information out there. Like I was on Pinterest. I was, I was everywhere. Trying, I was asking in Facebook groups it was, it's, it's very hard to find information on how to do a show and how to do it well. So, um, so, so I just, you literally just said, well, I think this is where clients are. Let me yeah. test it. Yeah. And luckily my husband, uh, is very supportive and was like, okay, let's give it a shot. And, and uh, how many did you book on your first one? Nine. Nine. Holy Nine. smoke. That's a lot. That's great results. Nine with my two clients and you know, my one album, yeah. Wow. And by the way, I, I guess that's, uh, I actually have a, um, I, I always say, you know, like a lot of times people get stopped before and my shitty little <laughs> drawing here, people stop before they start seeing results. So like, it's crazy to me that like, you're about to like walk off this cliff of let me do yeah. these bridal shows that no one really talks about. No one really knows if they work. 
I don't really have a proven system, but let me just like step off the ledge. And the crazy thing is, is like what you're trying to get to like a place where you're like booking out for the year and you have no idea how to get there. But the fact that you take a step off the ledge and you start learning and you you make a few mistakes, it costs you a little bit, you start breaking even. Then as it gets good and you have like a script, you have a perfect offer, you have more people help you and yeah. you, know, you keep helping yourself. Like you start to get to a version of yourself where it's like, now you've mastered this. Yeah. And, and it, it's just incredible to even take that step off. And it's, I think that's a huge part, right? Like you had a lot of momentum when you had those first nine, even though, by the way, like I think a lot of the times too, like if you go into Facebook groups and people start warning you and telling you, no, that's going to be bad. Or these are all the bad things that happened to me. Right. And then you start doubting everything and you never take the step off. Like that could have just destroyed this whole vision. So like, how do you deal with it? Like, how do you deal with like your doubts anytime you're like, I don't really know where you have uncertainty. So I don't really have uncertainty. I don't really think like that. I'm always thinking 10 steps ahead. So I'm not necessarily thinking like, what if this fails? I'm thinking about when this succeeds, this is what I'm doing next. So I think that mindset has a lot to do with that. And I never really, and this is so funny that I'm even talking about this now because when I would hear people talk about mindset and have like going to mindset classes, I would be like, what a fucking waste of time. Because instead of doing all that, you could just be doing it. You know what I mean? So, but now that I'm like on the other side and really successful, I look back and I think, it was because of my mindset that I'm successful now because I failure wasn't really an option. Like I, I didn't even, it wasn't even in my vision that I was going to fail. It was only when this succeeds, I'm going to do this. And, and that continues to help me. Like my husband always says he he can't keep up with me because I'm always thinking like, you know, a year down the road, two years down the road, what's this going to look like? How can I make things better? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, but still like the investment for the bridal show, it was scary. We put it on a credit card. We did not have $800 to give. Like it was, you know, it was a risk. Um, but once we, when we did one and it was successful and by the way, I was pregnant with Scarlett when we did that show. So that was, uh, 2016, I was pregnant at that show too. My very first one, I was like maybe 22 weeks pregnant. So I've been pregnant a lot in the last yeah. <laughs> four or five years. I'm done being pregnant, but I was pregnant. <laughs> By the way, um, just for someone who's wondering, like, and like for me, especially for guys, like I have no idea how these bottle shows go. I don't, I don't even know why anyone would want to go. Like, why would you not want to just search this stuff on your phone? Yeah. Um, so like, how do you even like choose? How did you even choose the first one? How do you make your selection? How, like how many are you going to have wow. next year? So, um, so next year I'm only doing two because I'm booked out. Like I only have maybe 10 dates in 2020 that I can fill, but I'm, I consider myself fully booked right now. Those 10 dates are just like, you know, Hey, if I book it, I'll take it. Cause I like money, but, um, but really I'm booked out for 2020. So I'm doing two shows and I did two shows this year. And then, um, in how, 20- many, how many were you doing when you started? Uh, that first year in 2016, I did about eight, eight shows. Holy smokes. And yeah. by the way, like how, how much do they cost and how do you, how do you pay? So between my least expensive show is 400 and then my most expensive show is that Philly show that um, I showed that I was pregnant at um, last year or this year, I guess it was. And that's about 1500. But the most important thing is that you get the email list from the show. Like you need to get those emails and the contacts because you can build your email automation and build your audience like that. And building that email automation was huge for me. It was a huge game changer. I feel like, yeah, I feel like that's one big thing that a lot of people, when they go to these shows or expos that they like almost forget, like, of course you have the benefit of, um, and I, we actually had a photographer that we worked with that she had something like, I don't know, like 10 bookings from, from some, some sort of campaign like that. Yeah. And no kidding. She was like really not depressed, but she was very disappointed. She was like, man, like this didn't go too well. Like you know, was this a failure? What could we have done better? And it was like, wait, did you follow up with people? 
And then we were like, oh, we could do that. And I was like, yeah, let's like, let's hit the phones. Let's hit, you know, let's hit email. They booked something like over 45 people after that. Yeah. So most people just drop the ball on that or they're not prepared. They'll try to do it six months later. So yeah. Yeah. And it's so important to have an email automation that continues because I will book people from shows that I did two years ago. Like the, the, the whole, the most important thing is to reach your target audience in as many ways as possible. So if they're on your email automation, try and get them in your VIP group. If they're in your VIP group, you get their email. That way they're seeing you in as many different places as possible so that when they're ready to book, they think of you first. You're, you know, in the front of their mind. It's very important that you continue to have as many touch points as possible with your prospective client base. Have you had people like, what's the farthest back somebody has booked? Like, or is like, do you have people from like your first bridal show or like your first year ever come back and say, Hey, we met way back then. Yeah. So I actually have a good story about that. This year I had a client book me and, um, and Nikki, my studio manager now does a lot of bookings. And I hear this from photographers a lot. Like I don't have people to help me. And so I can't do what you do. I'm like, no, like I didn't have a studio manager all this time. Like that's not how I started. I used to do this all myself, you know? Um, but anyway, so she books people now. So she had booked this girl and her name was Jen too. So she comes for a shoot and I was like, Oh, you know, how'd you find me? And she's like, funny story. She's like, about seven years ago, you were pregnant. <laughs> Here we go again. I was pregnant and I saw them in a Christmas tree farm and they had their baby Delaney with them. And this baby, their, their baby was just beautiful. She had these big blue eyes. She was maybe like seven months old and I was pregnant and we were about to shoot my gender reveal pictures. My husband and I were just going to shoot them. And I saw her and I was, I was, you know, I was, um, Oh gosh, inspired by their baby. I was like, can I just take a picture of her? She's just a beautiful child. I'll just email you the picture. You know, you don't have to pay me. I just, her face, she's just beautiful. And so they were like, yeah, sure. So I took the picture of the baby and I emailed it to them. And then they got on my email list. And seven years later, Jen, the wife, she booked me. And that was, it was a $5,000 sale. But she stayed, they stayed in my email automation seven years. That was like the first, it was like two years after I got my camera. Yeah. That's really awesome. So I know, I know we went back to a little bit about right now. So let's just, let's just say it's someone like me that says like, Oh my God, I am super scared to like order these backdrops and order these samples. Yeah. And like the thought of talking to a hundred people, because I'm assuming too, like, so we just did like an art show for every one person that said yes to like participate, we probably had like three people say no. So there's like a lot of no's that go into it. And yeah. it, like, I remember thinking when we were doing that, I was like, okay, I can get past this because they're not saying no to me. They have their own lives, whatever. It's not yeah. like really rejecting me. But I remember thinking like for somebody else, this could be like really impactful. Yeah. So for someone who says, Jen, like I don't want to get any no's and that's not my personality. Like, what would be like your fallback? Let's just say that didn't work nowadays. For some reason, bridal yeah. shows change. And yeah. Well, so I think like in any sort of sale, sales job, because that's what we're doing. If you're running a business, you're a business owner first. And sales is a part of our job. Um, and I think a lot of creatives will fly away from that because they want to focus on the art. But it is important, you know, you're going to get a lot of no's and you just have to stay focused on the yeses because, you know, just like, just like some products at the store, like when you're going for it to buy, uh, I don't know, some wine, right? Like there are some people like certain types of wine, other people like other types of wine. It doesn't mean I'm saying no to wine because who's going to say no to wine, <laughs> but, um, it just means that you have preferences. So I don't ever get worked up about no's. Um, but so like if there wasn't bridal shows, what would I do? Is that, yeah. yeah, I would totally prospect on Facebook. We have access like at our fingertips, thousands and thousands of people, groups of people, you know, where they shop, you know, where they work, you know, who their friends are, you know, what they like to do. It's so powerful. The power of Facebook is unreal. And even like, you know, five or six years ago when I started this, it, I feel like it wasn't as powerful as it is now. I feel like it's just gotten like 
more, more. Like, yeah, more. like everyone, and, everyone's more connected. It's easier to yeah. connect with every single person online. Um, and I, I always think that, right? Like back in the day, and I guess this is a testament you kind of touched on, like how much easier it is to start a business nowadays, right? Like yeah. back in the day, you would have to learn how to do things in the dark room. You'd have to actually yeah. buy photography education, like to even learn the camera. Yeah. And then to like even start a website, you'd have to pay thousands of dollars. Yeah. Most people didn't even have cell phones. So like you were in the yellow pages, right? Like I remember yeah. hearing a story that somebody was going around selling like, um, you know, like online listing pages and people were like, do you think you can ever replace this yellow book? This is where business will always be done. No, nope. you know? Yeah. So just the fact that like nowadays is just so much easier. And it's funny because I know I ask you this and for you, it's like, oh, easy. Like, but for some people, it's like, well, no, Jen, like it's still hard out there. Yeah. I, it was funny. I um, flew home from, I was speaking at a conference in Texas in November and I flew home. Um, I've, I fly first class because why not? If I'm working my ass off, right? Yeah. So I sat beside Ray, um, who owns this. Did I tell you about this? Have I told you about Ray? No. I sat beside Ray. He was like this classic, like Texas guy. He's like 70. He owns a business installing indoor playground floors, right? Um, like at McDonald's and Ikea. And he has all these big accounts. Like that's his account, like Ikea's, like McDonald's all over the world, right? So I'm like, Ray, how do you find business? Um, like where, how are you finding business? He's like, I don't know. I talk to people. <laughs> And I started telling him, I was like, so let me see your website. And he's like, um, and he pulls it up. And I was like, oh, do you have a Facebook pics on this? He goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> he had no idea. And so back in the day, because my dad does business the same way. He owns a water softener company and they're super successful. And he has no idea about any of this stuff either. But he talks to people and he networks. And that's like what's missing in our culture now is like actually talking to people. We just assume that like Google is going to do everything for us, but it's not the case here. Ray, he's 70 running a, you know, tens of million dollar business all over the world. And he's finding his business by talking to people. You know, I think it's, I think it's something that a lot of us like lose sight of in the digital age that we're in, you know, but it's important. And that's probably why bridal shows work so well, right? Because you're turning all these cold leads into warm leads, like instantly. Um, and the same with prospecting, why it's so powerful. You are reaching out to people like personally, instead of like depending on Google to do all of your work for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's free, right? Yeah. Uh, and I actually think, you know, as blessed as we are to have all these tools and you're right, maybe sometimes it like diminishes the, you know, those muscles that we used to have, right? Like, yeah. kind of like back in the day, we used to have to hunt for our food. Most people yeah. can't go hunt for their food. Like right. if it's in the grocery right. aisle, we'll eat it. If not, we'll start. Right. Um, but I know you gotta go pick up your kid and I don't want to keep you here forever. Yeah. Yeah. I have buses coming. Take you back down memory lane. Thank you so much for the insight and yeah, thanks yeah. for chatting. Yeah, for anyone listening, hey, th hopefully this serves an encouragement. Uh, 2020 is about to start, depending on when you're listening to this. Well, 2020 will always start here in a couple of days, but regardless yeah. of where you're listening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Jen, and we'll we'll talk soon. Bye.